Wait, have you guys not been able to hear me this entire time? Wait, can you hear me again? Or have you never been able to hear me? Okay. I, my mic wasn't on this entire time. I went on an entire spiel. I went on an entire spiel about this euro that I got. Now I have to pull up the euro again. Oh my goodness. Look, this euro, this euro, it's what, it's what is sustaining us today. This is a year of magic. Listen, I was letting you guys in on a little secret. And that's, I don't know anything about compilers. But we're going to learn together today. Okay, goals for the stream. We learn a little bit about compilers. Euro? Euro? G-Y-R-O. Euro. G-Y-R-O. This is a Euro. It's delicious. You should try it sometime. Yes, it is. It abs it's not gyro. You don't go to a place and order a gyro. Ugh. Ugh. Quiznos, what are you doing? Listen. I'm sorry, XTFitty, but you're, you're wrong. Euro pronunciation. Ye, Rose. Ye. XTFitty, I'm sorry, but the yees have it. The yees have it, XTFitty. Wait, we have someone in here named Zlatan Best, or is it, or is that somebody else? Are you talking about someone other than the footballer, or is that in relation to the footballer, the guy that was on PSG and now is playing in MLS? Please tell me that's a Zlatan reference. If not, that's okay too. Zlatan, okay, <laughs> XCFD. It's not true. It's not true. Okay. So let's get started. We're going to be doing compilers today. I think it's going to be a fun course. Let's discard these changes. Let's find... Where is... Computer Networks? The Fisher Crichton Crafting a Compiler Book. Hmm. Hmm. He was on Man United? Okay. Yes, it's Swedish for Zlatan is best. Okay, nice. Listen, I'm a big fan of Zlatan. He's also internationally broken... Or it's also intentionally bro uh, broken grammatically because that's how he says it. Okay. <laughs> uh... Okay. Well, we have crafting a compiler open, so perhaps it's best that we jump right in. Okay, the goal for tomorrow, I keep getting sidetracked. The goal for tomorrow, we get the NPR morning edition, the intro little jingle. We play that before, we, we play that before the stream. And then all the transitions are going to be NPR related. Everything's going to be some pun on NPR. That's the goal. But until then, let's learn about compilers. So what are we going to learn today? What? See, this is this is very fun. It's what are we going to learn today? I don't know compilers. Some of you guys may not know compilers. We get to learn this together. Isn't this going to be fun? This is interesting. Okay. So what are we going to go over? I think we can make it through chapter one and two today. I think we can. What do you guys think? Do you think we can make it through chapters one and two? I think we might be able to. Let's see. So chapter one's gonna go over an introduction about how the compilation process works, the concepts of constructing a compiler, and then what those uh, components actually are, and some of the tools that we can use to make them. Pretty interesting stuff. Let's change the stream title. I don't think people know. We learn compilers today. Okay, let's update that stream title. Nice, we're updated. We're fresh, we're hip, we're new. 
we've got this. So chapter two. Hey, Uncle Bill, how's it going? Okay, so part two, we're going to introduce this language called AC. It's going to be a very simple language. Wait, you're a PhD computer engineer student that doesn't know about compilers? It's not my area. Computer engineering is a pretty broad area. So when I say I don't know com about compilers, I know the basics of the compilation process, and I know about lexers, and I know about parsers, and I know about intermediate representation. Yeah. So I know I so I know about all that stuff, and I know about it in regards to architecture, and I know about concepts like uh, just-in-time compilation, but as far as actual compilers themselves, I've never taken a formal course on it. Okay, so chapter two, we're going to introduce a language and we're going to see how each of these components translate from AC to a second language, DC. And they say that we can get the complete code in this supplement. Yeah, exactly, Lev. I'm computer engineer. That means whenever I write spaghetti code, you have to accept it. You're forced to accept my spaghetti code. How does that make you feel, guys, that you have to accept my spaghetti code? Okay. So we're not going to cover scanning, or grammars and parsing, or top-down parsing, or bottom-up parsing today. But this will be something that we'll be covering in later streams. Most likely next week. Intermediate representation. I know a little bit about LLVM as well. Only if you accept mine. Oh, only if I accept your spaghetti code? Listen, Racy. I'll accept your spaghetti code. How can I? Listen. If you guys watch me write code at some point on this stream, we might as well just open, we can open up an Olive Garden or an Italian restaurant right here and now. And you can have all the spaghetti you want. Unlimited pasta. Feels like I have to debug an awful GitHub lib someone on my team has randomly thrown on my project. Okay. I understand that. However, have you have you ever seen code written by graduate students? Hmm. Let's look at let's look at a piece of code. Let's look at GPGPU sim. Let's look at a single thing from GPGPU sim. All right, so let's go to the dev branch. Uh, let's go to, ah, let's go to libcuda. Let's go to the CUDA runtime API implementation. And let's go to CUDA, uh, nope, register fat binary. Okay, ready? This is going to be fun. So let's see what this this big thing does. So it checks if the CUDA runtime version is less than 2010. It will never be, so it never it it'll never hit this. Next, it loads in the context. It creates this variable next fat bin handle. So it's just a handle. So it checks if in the uh, context that it loads, it uses a uh, CUDA object dump. It, it checks here, or it doesn't check, but we have a conditional now of if the CUDA runtime version is less than six. This is so old. We're at 9.1 right now. It will never be six. Okay, so it will never do anything in here. So all it does, so this code is pointless. All it does is create a string that says default. Then all it does is it sets, we declared a variable up here, next fat bin handle. All we do is assign it to another unsigned long long. That's all we do here. And then next fat bin, we increment by one. We print something out. We do an assert to check. When we run a kudo object dump init, we register the fat binary and then we return. This function, all it does, it sets a variable to one, it calls a function with, 
the argument one and a file name default. That's it. Isn't that amazing? This is a simulator that's used by every single academic for simulating GPU microarchitecture. This and look, this entire part of the code will never be run. None of this. None of this. This is all pointless. This is dead code. <laughs> okay. We spent enough time getting derailed on this and how to pronounce Euro. As you can see, ye rose. Okay. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? What is this? Okay. Let's get to chapter one. Oh, a dedication. Let's read the dedication. It's dedicated to Lisa in memory of Stanley. Oh, poor Stanley. You love error handling. How good. You should always love it. Okay, so we're going to be covering an introduction and a simple compiler. So ideally, we'll get through about 56 pages today. A lot of this we can skip, though, because it's just going to be good. Rafo, how's it going, man? We're going to learn about compilers today. Are you having a wonderful Tuesday? Listen, we're going to have an NPR stream. Okay, Daddy? All right. I'll be a father figure. Okay, so this is some more breakdown of what we're going to be doing today, but we can continue and move on. Let's go ahead and get to that chapter one. What are the different NPR shows? Um, there's Morning Edition. There's uh, NPR programs. I forgot. All Things Considered. Okay, so we're gonna do. Uh, we're going to do. Wait, wait, what's up? Are you, this? Well, this page is intentionally left blank. Is that what you're confused about? It's okay, it's okay that it's blank. Don't tell me. All things considered, all, all compilers considered, all architectures considered, maybe we should name it that. Fresh air, fresh architectures. Planet money, planet architecture I need to get those jingles though I need them Ubuntu yeah man listen this is an Ubuntu only stream don't tell me oh yeah wait wait don't tell me that's right I love wait wait don't tell me that's one of my favorites do you guys remember car talk Clicking clack, the Tappet Brothers. I loved Car Talk. Funny show. Okay. Enough chit chat. Let's get started, friends. So we're going to go over the history of compilers, their construction, and some organizational knowledge on compilers. So this kind of level, I know. Well, not not click and clack. They're both not dead. Only one of them's dead. One of them is still very much alive. Fun fact, they graduated from MIT. They're both MIT engineers, if I'm not mistaken. OK, so in general, this, this area of study that we're going to be talking about is called language processing. And so what we care about is preparing a language to be run on a computer. And so this is important to both people that write code, people that design compilers to make optimal code, and it's very important to architects that have to run this code. So what does a language processor do? Language processors ensure that a program conforms to its programming language's specifications. So this means that this has to translate this higher level language into the instruction set architecture that's been defined by someplace like ARM or someplace like Intel with x86. Okay, so we have really two different extremes. So one is an interpreter. Interpreter. So this runs a program by looking at high-level constructs and simulating their actions. And then on the other side, we have compilers that we take this high-level code and we turn them into low-level machine instructions that are executed directly. So something like um, 
Python would be an interpreted language while C is a compiled language. I think that's correct. Okay, this just goes over what we're going to learn in each of the sections. So we're going to learn about syntax, which means structure, semantics, which means meaning. So we'll probably see some cool examples of this. And so here's a basic idea of what we want to do with a compiler. So the, the fundamental idea of a compiler is actually very simple. We want to take some programming language, we want to give it to a black box, and we, on the other side we want code that could be executed directly on the hardware. So it goes high level language compiler language processing. So the compi so part of the compiler will do this language processing. So during this entire compile stage, we're going to be doing the language high level language. It's going to be we're going to process both the syntax and the semantics of this high level programming language. And then with some optimizations, we will turn this into machine language. So oftentimes the compiler will produce better code than you have written because you can think of this as an optimization step as well as the actual translating to machine language. If this just directly translated to machine language, you would get incredibly slow software. Incredibly slow. So compilers can do things like loop unrolling, which we'll probably go into in another time. Uh, it, can, it can do reordering of instructions. Um, very, very inter uh, interesting stuff. It can even do things so volatile. Volat so I'm sure some of you people know about volatile, correct? So it's a common thing in uh, parallel programming when things don't work. A very common thing is to just start throwing the keyword volatile around variables. And the reason is volatile, what that does is it ensures that when something is compiled that something isn't um, that variable isn't cached or no it's it isn't put in a register it ensures that that has to stay in memory I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I got that right so that's why people usually use volatile and it's to it's usually for some synchronization issues okay so more about the sections we're going to be covering but we can go ahead and start at the actual meat and, uh, meat and potatoes of what we're going to cover. So the history of compilation. So what we really want is we want things to be portable. We don't want to have to write based upon, we don't want to have to write our code every single time we go on a new platform. We don't want it to change on the platform. We want to write the code once and then have something else taking care of the low level architecture. So the compiler that you may know, Grace Murray Hopper. Um, that was a term coined by her. In fact, it's um, Admiral Hopper, um, former Admiral Hopper. She's deceased now. So this translation uh, was origi originally viewed as a uh, compilation of a sequence of machine language subprograms selected from a library. So at that time, uh, compilation was also called automatic programming. So it's actually a funny historical fact that a lot of people thought that, you know, this idea of having something automatically do translation, most, most, most people were skeptical. There were skeptics. Back in the day, there were skeptics. But look at these skeptics. These skeptics are a lot more interesting than, than the ones today. These skeptics, at least, you know, their concern was about the ability to automatically translate something. How far we've fallen. How far. Truly, this is the end times. Okay. So one of the first compilers was for the language Fortran. And this was in the late 1950s. And so they presented the user with a problem-oriented, largely machine-dependent source language. So this was at a time where the language that you were programming in was actually very tied to the architecture versus today where it's very independent of the architecture. So C is the same whether you're writing it on a Mac um, 
that has maybe some ARM core on it, or it's the same thing if you're running it on an Intel chip. It's the same thing if you're running it on, I don't know, some crazy IBM architecture. IBM loves to make crazy architectures, um, which is actually, so a lot of people give IBM some flack because they call them like the old people and um, they're they're not very progressive in a lot of ways and they give IBM a lot of criticism but they come up with some of the most interesting stuff that never makes it to market their research stuff is incredibly interesting so basically what we can think of now as Fortran is that it proved the viability of high language compile or high level compiled languages so it proved that you could have a higher level language that could be effectively and efficiently translated and so this caused basically a flood of other languages to follow. Okay, so what are we going to be doing in this book? We're going to mastery of the fundamentals. So we really want to get the idea of what a compiler is and what it does. That way we can extend this to any arbitrary compile that we work on, including things like just-in-time compilation like Java uses. So like we said, it, we tra we're translating conventional programming languages such as C, C++, and Java, into machine languages. So there's also so it's used in a lot of ways though that a lot of that a lot of times people don't immediately recognize. So tech and LaTeX, which are typesetters, that if you do anything academic, you should be very familiar with these two things. Uh, these. Are, these, there are an, an, these are another example of compilers because they compile the LaTeX code you write and then instead of running some application or doing something like that, it, it does typesetting for you. And so formatting commands. So then there's PostScript, which is generated by many programs, is really a programming language, and it is translated and executed by printers. So that's for printers. LaTeX. Yeah, man, it's really cool. Then there's Mathematica. So that's that mixes uh, programming with mathematics. I've never actually used Mathematica. I've used MATLAB a lot, but never Mathematica. TM, yeah. Postscript. No, that's that's not TM. It's it's a registered trademark. It's not just a it's just it's not just a trademark. It's a registered trademark. But Java TM, yeah. Okay. And then there's uh. What I would consider to be the most interesting of languages, Verilog and VHDL. Okay. Can anyone off the, so VHDL is another one of those great electrical engineering acronyms. So VHDL, V is an entire acronym. V actually stands for very high speed integrated circuit. That's what V stands for. And then HDL is hardware description language. Why did they do this? They could have given it any name, but they chose to have V stand for very high speed integrated circuit. Nobody looking at this would be able to understand that. So this is a really interesting thing. This is actually a silicon compiler. So what it does is it takes code so in Verilog, the code looks very much like C or C++. In VHDL, it looks a lot like the old programming language that was a DoD language called Ada. And it takes this code, it compiles it, but it makes circuits. It doesn't, it doesn't compile to machine instructions. It actually designs hardware. And there's some very interesting research that's done in this area. So compiler technology is of value in almost any program that presents non-trivial text-oriented command set, including the command and scripting languages of operating systems and query languages, blah, 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 blah. That sounds really neat. I agree. We should do an entire section on hardware description languages and digital design. That would be a lot of fun. So what do compilers do? So with a compiler, we always have two things. We have a source and we have a target. And we want to turn the source into a form um, the target can understand. So this suggests that compilers do about the same thing, 
that the only difference is really the source and target languages. So there's some subtlety here though. So while the issue of the accepted source language is indeed simple, there are many alternatives in describing the output of the compiler. So this can be, you can determine the output by the kind of machine code or by the format, format of the target code. Yeah, so we'll see this later. So as far as machine code generated, so this could be pure machine code, augmented machine code, or virtual machine code. So we'll go into all three of these. So pure machine code. So compilers may generate code for a particular machine's instruction set without assuming the existence of any operating system. So here, this is like compiling something for an x86 processor, not assuming that it's running Windows or not assuming that it's running Ubuntu. So this is often called pure code because there's nothing that ties it to an operating system. It's purely just looking at the architecture. But this is rare because compilers rely on runtime libraries and operating system calls to interface with the generated code. So we don't see this very often. So this is usually for uh, system implementation languages, which are actually used for making operating systems or embedded applications, so embedded applications that it's some microcontroller. Okay, so what is augmented machine code? So augmented machine code, they generate code for machine architecture that is augmented with an operating system. So this time we're considering Windows or Ubuntu when we are compiling something. And also with runtime language support routines. Okay, and then they give some examples. So most Fortran compilers use such software support only for I.O. and mathematical functions. However, however, others rely on it for much of their functionality. So what are these kinds of functions that we need uh, extra support for? So these can be things such as uh, more simple things such as uh, moving bit fields and data uh, transfer instructions. But it could also be for call instructions, so how do we pass parameters, save registers, allocate stack space, and also to do things like dynamic storage, so heap allocation. Now lastly, this is when we're going to get something more Java related. Now I don't program in Java, so if there's a Java expert here, I'm sorry. However, we can continue on. <laughs> The third type of code generated is composed entirely of virtual instructions. So these are instructions that aren't going to be run directly on the hardware because they're virtual. So this is, uh, this is mainly for things that are supposed to be portable. So Java, they have the slogan of write, run, write once, run anywhere. And so you have to write an interpreter for a virtual machine. So basically these, this code is running on a virtual machine or any target architecture of interest. So code generated by the compiler can then be run on any architecture for which a VM interpreter is available. And so that's what this Java virtual machine is. So then we talk a little bit about, okay, so we have a compiler. So there's a process called bootstrapping and all bootstrapping refers to is the process of porting such a compiler from one architecture to another. So and this is in figure 1.2. So bootstrapping a compiler that generates VM instructions, the shaded portion is a portable compiler for L that can run on any architecture supported by the VM. So we have a compiler for L written in K, we have an extant compiler for K, then we have the first instance compiler for L Write, write once, run away, Tony Stank. Listen, my favorite one that I've ever heard is write once, break anywhere. That's, that's my favorite joke on Java. Now, I don't actually program in Java, so I won't bash it too hard, but I didn't like it when I, I did it for about three or four months, I taught myself Java, but write once, break anywhere was about my favorite that I ever heard. So it looks like we have this, uh, this reference compiler for L written in L. And so that's going to play into this idea of bootstrapping. 
And so then they go into a little bit about Java bytecodes, but this is mainly historical. Um, so we can kind of skip over a lot of this and get to more of the interesting bits, such as just-in-time compilation. This is more foundational knowledge. So when an entire virtual instruction set is used as the target language, the instruction set must be interpreted in software. In a just-in-time approach, virtual instructions can be translated to target code just as they are about to be executed. So this means you've got something running, you want something to be compiled, right before it runs, it sends it off to be compiled, and you usually get a little bit of acceleration because you're basically pre-compiling things. Or you're compiling things that you know you're going to need. So it makes it a little bit faster. So if virtual instruction set is used often enough, it is possible to develop special microprocessors that implement, implement the virtual instruction set in hardware. So apparently this thing, Giselle, offers hardware support to improve the performance of mobile phone applications that execute the Java virtual machine. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that people would want to do that. In summary, most compilers generate code that interfaces with runtime libraries, operating system utilities, and other software. So we write code that isn't standalone. We write code that isn't purely just looking at what architecture am I on. We want to interact with operating systems. It's convenient for us to do so. And then additionally, it may also be nice for us to use something like virtual machines just for portability and maybe consistency of program execution. So the theory behind write once run anywhere is that it doesn't matter your architecture. You have the JVM, you run your Java code, it should behave and work the same everywhere. That is how Java works in theory. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about target code formats. So we have assembly or other source formats. We have a relocatable binary or an absolute binary. So the first thing is the most simple to understand, which is simply the assembly language. So the generation of assembly simplifies and modularizes translation. A number of code generation decisions, such as instruction and data addresses, can be left for the assembler. This approach is common for compilers developed as instructional projects or for prototyping, uh, prototyping programming language designs. One reason for this is that the assembly code is relatively easy to scrutinize, which makes the compilation process more transparent for students and prototyping activities. So generating assembler code is also useful for cross-compilation, where the compiler executes on one computer but generates code that executes on another. I've had to do some really awful stuff with cross-compilation, trying to work on both a desktop and a mobile platform, specifically a Nexus 5 smartphone. I was doing a little bit of, it was going to be Nic processing on mobile GPUs. So on the little Qualcomm GPU that's on the Snapdragon SoC. Yeah, the cross compilation thing is a nightmare sometimes. Okay. So sometimes another programming language such as C is generated by a compiler instead of a, instead of a specific assembly language. So apparently C has been called a universal assembly language because it's low level yet it is far more platform independent than any particular assembly language so a particular assembly language of course will have machine specific instructions however C has that same kind of low level feel where you're directly doing stuff with memory you have stuff like pointers Java doesn't have anything like pointers at least as far as I know it doesn't have anything like pointers so it's very low it's it's pretty low level however it's high level enough where people can program in it relatively easily at least in the time that this book was released people don't people think that c is the hardest thing in the world right now listen chat you guys got to talk to me a little bit why do people hate on c and c++ so much 
is it just because that what most people what most people do now they don't they don't need speed they don't care about optimal performance so they can get away with using something like python i mean i get it's i get that python is easier than c but i feel like people make c out to be way harder than it is i feel like you spend about a week learning about pointers you shouldn't ever have a problem with pointers again Ah, oh, there are plenty of RAM in. Okay. <laughs> Too easy to do undefined behavior. Sure, I'd agree with that. Because there's a limited amount of mental resources in a day, and they'd rather not use it on frivolous stuff. So I don't, I don't mind it though. Okay, uh, Jay Goon. This is so. So this is more of my problem with it. I see people that are new to programming get on the hate bandwagon of C and C++ when honestly when you're doing that introductory level stuff like solving math problems and doing loops honestly C and Python are almost exactly the same <laughs> I, it's this weird thing where there's this hate against C and people don't even know the difficult parts of C or anything about memory management or garbage collection and they they pretend that they hate it with a passion. Okay, we can move on. So let's talk about relocatable binary format. So most production quality compilers do not generate assembly language. Okay, why is that? Direct generation of target code in relocatable or absolute binary format is more efficient and allows the compiler more control over the translation process. It is nonetheless beneficial for the compiler's output to be open to scrutiny. So that means that we're not going to expect things to be perfect. Didn't a psych memer find that C was actually easier to learn than Python or JavaScript because uh, it is a lot more rigid? Like classes that began in C were better at tracing programs. I'd, I've never heard about that. I'd imagine it. I mean, with something like Python, you have to worry about something like white space. Not that white space is terribly difficult concept to understand, but that's not something that directly contributes anything other than formatting to the code. So you don't have classes, no? No, they don't have classes. C++ has classes. I mean, there is no class. But he's not talking about classes like that. He's talking about like a course in C. Not not the actual like object oriented programming classes. Okay. So compilers that produce bina uh, binary format typically can produce a pseudo assembly language listing of gen generated code. So such a listing shows the instructions generated by the compiler with annotations to document storage references. So relocatable binary format. So what is it? It's essentially a form of code that most assemblers generate. This format can also be generated directly by a compiler. External references, local instruction addresses, and data addresses are not yet bound. So this means that we've generated something that's fairly, that it's fairly low level. It has some instruction feel to it. But we're not setting in stone anything that may be more machine dependent. So we're leaving a lot of room for flexibility. OK. The latter alternative makes it easy to group together code sequences or data areas. A linkage step is required to incorporate any support libraries, as well as other separately compiled routines referenced within a compiled program. The result is absolute binary format. So. We'll probably talk about sometime in here the process of linking and loading, which can also be an interesting problem. I actually ran into a problem with a dynamically linked library with a simulator I was using, and I was having some trouble with 
two libraries that were ha that had the same name. That was fun. So both relocatable binary and assembly language formats allow modular compilation. So what's modular compilation? So this is where we take a large program. We have it as separately compiled pieces. Okay, so that means we can compile things kind of separately and then at this very end state we can mix and match everything together as we need. So this allows things like cross-language support. So not everything has to be written in a specific language. If we have some modular uh, state, we can combine things together that were written in different languages. Okay. And so what is absolute binary format? So some sh compilers generate this. And so this can be directly executed when a compiler is finished. So you compile something, you can immediately run it. However, this means that we're very limited in being able to talk with this code. This code is very set in stone. It's already ready to be run on the architecture. Okay, so quick summary. So there's a lot of alternatives to what we can do. There's things like bytecode that Java does and we see that there's a lot of different ways we can start looking at designing compilers. So we have some that run up for virtual machines. We have different targets that we can compile to depending on what we want or what we need. And we also can intuitively know there's a lot of different inputs that we can have. So different languages, different language structures. So an interpreter, interpreters are fairly simple. We have a source program encoding. We have input data. We give this both something called the interpreter, and this generates some output. And we'll go into more of what this output is. Let's see. So this just talks more about this idea of absolute binary format and something like dynamic linking. That's OK. We can move on to interpreters, though. So interpreters. So another kind of language processor is the interpreter. Interpreters share some of the functionality found in compilers. So what an interpreter will do, just like a, a compiler will do, is syntactic and semantic analysis. So you can think of this as uh, a sentence checking if the grammar makes sense of a sentence, and then also checking if the meaning makes sense of a sentence. So how do they differ though? So interpreters differ from compilers in that they execute programs without explicitly performing much translation. So figure 1.3 that we just saw illustrates schematically how interpreters work. To an interpreter, a program is merely data. So the program itself is the data that can be arbitrarily manipulated just like any other data. The locus of control during execution resides in the interpreter, not in the user program. So here we have some source program. However, usually we consider when we're going to run something, we're running the source program. But in actuality, the interpreter is the thing driving this. So what do interpreters do that compilers don't? So programs can be easily modified as execution proceeds. This provides a straightforward interactive debugging capability. So this is nice for us because the program can be modified to pause at points of interest or to display the value of program variables. This is very, very nice. So depending on program structure, program modifications may require reparsing or repeating semantic analysis. And we'll go over all these terms like semantic analysis when we cover them in their respective uh, sections. So languages in which the type of an object is developed dynamically, such as Lisp and Scheme, are easily supported by an interpreter. Some languages, such as Smalltalk and Ruby, I've never actually used Ruby, allow the type system itself to change dynamically. Since the user program is continuously re-examined, as execution proceeds, symbols do not have a fixed meaning. So symbols can change over time. And so this leads us to this idea of fluid binding. So such 
fluid bindings are more problematic for compilers since dynamic change in the meaning of a symbol make direct translation into machine code more difficult. So usually when we're compiling things, we want we run a compiler, we have something, and we go, this is what this does, it will always do this. It's already in the form that a processor knows. But when we're talking about fluid bindings, we need something that's flexible. We need something that can change over time. That's my interpretation of this. Remember, this is my first time taking a compilers class too, so we're learning this together. So feel free to call me out if you're not sure on something, because I might not be too sure on it either. Okay. We doing well? Is everyone doing well? I think we're we're getting a lot of good education in right now. Okay. Let's move on. So interpreters. So what do interpreters do? So interpreters provide they also provide a degree of machine independence because we're not generating machine code. So that's nice. And so all we need to do to port an interpreter it can just be as simple as recompiling the interpreter on a different machine. That's about as far as we need to go with the changes. So, direct interpretation of source programs can involve significant overhead. So this is the reason why I think a lot of people make the mistake of, you know, depending on the area you go into. If you go into an area that uses Python for some applications, that's absolutely acceptable. But a lot of times what I see is electrical and computer engineers, they think, okay, I'll learn Python and I know a tool that I can use. So personally, and I think this is true for most people in computer engineering, Python is something that you use maybe once a month. Use it about once a month for automating some tasks or doing a little bit of data collection. Uh, a lot of times for computer engineering, what you care about is performance, and you care about having really, really tight control over what you're doing. So just for an example, I was doing a simulation in Python, and this was because I had done Python for the longest time, but I think I had to run about... 25 million iterations of some loop that w it was basically simulating a type of digital circuit. I had written the code to simulate a specific digital circuit to do to, to find some average uh, delays for random inputs. It was for an arithmetic circuit. And it took hours and hours and hours to run. I wrote the same program in C. It took less than an hour, far less than an hour, maybe 15 minutes. Very, very important to understand that there are overheads with this flexibility. So yes, for languages where such bindings can change arbitrarily, so Interpretation can be 100 times slower than compiled code. Now they're constantly working on making this better. So for most static languages such as C and Java, the cost difference is around 10, but when we get to something like Python, what about Java? Um, well, Java does the whole JVM thing and it has just-in-time compilation. So I think Java is a little bit uh, different of a case. Yeah, performance godsending? Yeah, listen, performance. Performance is in my area, that's what we care about. We care about performance. So in summary, all language processing involves interpretation at some level. Interpreters directly interpret source programs or some syntactically transformed versions of them. They may exploit the availability of source representation to allow program text to be changed as it is executed, as well as debugged. While a compiler has a distinct translation and execution phase, so these are not combined. So that's why you can run something in Python and it will fail at a certain point versus when you do something in C 
and you try to compile it, you may just crash at compilation. So that's what it means when it has this distinct translation and execution phase. Okay, so let's talk about syntax and semantics. So now we, need, we can start digging into some of these terms that we already looked at. Listen guys, welcome to the stream. If you're new here, my name is Engineering Today. I have a schedule below of all the courses that I teach. Weekends are going to be more for fun things like learning German and Japanese as well as Sundays, which will be more free and open to other things. I upload everything on YouTube. You can check out my YouTube below. Maybe give it a subscribe. Same thing with Twitch right here. If you want to follow me, get notifications when I get live. Or hey, if you're just testing out the stream today and you're just trying to see what I get up to, that's okay too. But I'm glad you're here anyway. So let's talk about syntax and semantics. So a complete definition of programming languages or language must include syntax or structure and semantics meaning. So we can think of this like we kind of made the example earlier. So structure, that's going to be similar to something like English. Uh, and so in a language like English, that will be how is a sentence constructed? Um, the parts of speech such as noun and verbs and adjectives and adverbs how those are connected together versus semantics, which is, okay, if I were to say this to somebody, does this make sense? Is this something that is correct? Something may be syntactically correct, but it may not have any meaning. So syntax typically means context free syntax because of the almost universal use of context free grammars as a syntactic specification mechanism. Syntax defines the sequences of symbols that are legal. So it says I can do A plus B, but I can't do A plus and then not leave anything afterwards. So let's take something such as, we may have something along the lines of A equals B plus C. So most, most programming languages have an assignment on the left, and then we can have an arbitrary number of you know, say variables and additions. However, while B plus C equals A means the same thing, it isn't in the correct order. So this is what we, we mean by structure. So the structure that we're looking at here is that we need an assignment first. And here does not have an assignment, therefore it would not be syntactically legal. Does that make sense? Okay, so however, not all aspects of well-formed programs can be described by context-free syntax. For example, context-free grammars cannot specify type compatibility and scoping rules. For example, a programming language may specify that we can have some assignment on the left and variables on the right, or Let's see, it may specify this is illegal if B or C is of type Boolean. Okay, so this is something like type checking. Because of the limitations of context-free grammars, the semantics of the programming language are commonly divided into two classes. So we have static semantics and runtime semantics. So what are static semantics? So this is the this is, we're getting more into the interesting parts of compilers now. Listen, if you know any friends that you think would enjoy this, or you think would need to know something like this, please tell them to stop by. I'd be happy to have them. If you guys have any content that you would like to hear, please just shoot me a message. So static semantics. The static semantics of a language provide a set of rules that specify which syntactically legal programs are actually valid. Such rules typically require that all identifiers be declared. So that means we have to say, declare everything as ints and floats and doubles and characters. Those all have to, those, all those identifiers must be declares that we're only say adding operators together that are type compatible means, okay, we declared this as an int we declared 
We declared A as an int. We declared B as an int. We declared C as a char, or maybe we declared it as a char pointer. Well, maybe we can't add a char pointer and an int together because they are different types. So that's, that's what they mean by type compatible. And that procedures be called with the proper number of parameters. So if we have a function that is supposed to get three parameters, we can't call it with two parameters. Thus, static semantics augment context-free specifications and complete the definition of valid programs. Okay. Static semantics can be specified formally or informally. The prose descriptions found in most programming language specifications are informal. They tend to be relatively compact and easy to read, but they're imprecise. So if we make something that's easy to read, oftentimes we're not doing a great job at specifying specifically what um, it should do. So I'm pretty sure this is uh, Donald Knuth. I'm pretty sure that this KNU68 is from Donald Knuth. If you don't know who Donald Knuth is, you should look him up sometimes. Very famous computer scientist, author of The Art of Computer Programming. So attribute grammars can formalize many of the semantic checks found in compilers. The following rewriting rule called production specifies that an expression denoted by E, so this is an expression, can be rewritten into a, an expression of E plus a term T. So we'll see how we can, we can expand on this later when we're doing, when we're going more into grammars. So this is, this is going to be a very interesting concept once we get to um, its section in the book. In an attribute grammar, this production might be augmented with a type attribute for E and T and a predicate testing for type compatibility. So we have, say, E result can be represented as E V1 plus T V2. And so then we have this check right here. So if V1.type equals numeric and V2.type equals numeric, then the result will be numeric. Else we call error. So in this case, we can say, okay, well, we can decompose this result into the sum of these two items here. However, these two items must be both of the type numeric or we get an error. Fairly straightforward. Okay, so abstract grammars are reasonably, that are a reasonable blend of formality and readability, but they can be rather verbose and tedious. So if we have to, we have to express something such as this for every possible case, we're going to wind up with a giant, just an absolutely massive size defining our entire language. Okay. So instead, we're going to propagate semantic information through a program's abstract syntax tree in a manner similar to the evaluation of attribute grammar systems. The specifics of a portion of semantics checking are thus written in the compiler as a semantics checking phase. So we have an entire phase that's dedicated to this semantics checking. And so we're going to be using this type in this book. Okay, I'm sure there's other types. So runtime uh, semantics. So we just went over static semantics. So what would runtime semantics be? Or execution semantics. So this is going to specify what a program computes. So we're, we're looking at results now at runtime. So these are often very specified very informal. They're very informally specified. So uh, alternatively, a more formal operational or interpreter model can be used. In such a model, a program state is defined and program execution is described in ter terms of uh, changes of state. So I'm pretty sure they're trying to describe a state machine here where based upon certain inputs, we must flow to certain stages. For example, the semantics of the statement A equals one 
is that the state component corresponding to A is changed to 1. Okay, pretty simple. A variety of approaches to defining runtime semantics of programming languages have been developed. Three of them, natural semantics, axiomatic semantics, and denotational semantics are described below. Okay, so we're going to go over these now. So natural semantics, otherwise known as structured operational semantics. So this is a formalization of the operational approach. So given if we know that assertions uh, are true before evaluation, we can infer assertions that will hold after the constructs evaluation. So if we have some prior knowledge, we may be able to, or we should be able to guess something about after the evaluation of what something will look like. Okay. So what are axiomatic semantics? So axiomatic definitions de created in 1981 by some paper, maybe it's Eric Grimson, can be used to model execution at a more abstract, uh, at a more abstract layer than operational models. So they are based on formally specified relations or predicates that relate program variables. So let's see if we can get an example. So an example the axiom defining var with an arrow from expression states that a predictive or a, pred a predictive a predicate involving var is true after statement execution if and only if the predicate obtained by replacing all occurrences of var by expression is true beforehand so for something like y equals 3 to be true after execution of the statement y is assigned to x plus 1 the predicate x plus 1 must be greater than 3. So this is basically saying that if we have something like x plus 1 and we assign it to y and we know that y must be greater than 3 that means we know that x plus 1 therefore must be greater than 3. So this would have to be true. Does that make sense? This is a little confusing the way they, they wrote it. Basically, they're saying that if we change the name of a variable over and over and over again, so say we have a variable that is, let me get out the drawing tablet. The drawing tablet might help here. Let's see. So, this is basically just saying if we assign a is equal to 5, then we assign b is equal to a, and then we assign c is equal to b, and somewhere down the line we have, say, d, we, we specify that d must be greater than 4, that means we can sub in over here, or let's say, let's just put C here. And we know that C must be greater than 4. That means we can skip past a lot of these intermediate stages. And we, ha we have to know that A must be greater than 4, and therefore five. we can directly evaluate 5 is greater than 4. So we can remove some of these intermediate stages. So that's what we mean. Uh, that's what this entire block is in this example they're trying to give. OK. Because x is an alias for y. So basically, what they mean by alias is that even we're not fundamentally changing it, we can still grab some expression to represent another variable with. So we can represent c by a because it doesn't it doesn't change across all of these transformations or it changes in a way that we can represent that transformation in something that we can substitute in for C. So the axiomatic approach is good for deriving proofs of programmatic correctness and this can be this can be something that's very convenient for us. Okay. However, 
What they don't do is they don't do a good job of modeling implementation considerations, such as running out of memory. Okay, so what are denotational semantics? So these are more mathematical, but they can be used to accommodate memory stores and fetches. So we have something here now that is more closely tied to architecture, which is neat. It's very interesting, actually. Okay, so a denotational definition may be viewed as a syntax-directed definition that specifies the meaning of a construct in terms of meaning of its immediate constituents. For example, to define addition, we might use the following rule. So if we have some value from memory t1 and some value from memory t2. I'm guessing this is meaning that where it's going to be the addition of these two things, but we have to store it in a size that could be represented by the sum of these two things. So the definition says that the value obtained by adding two sub-expressions, the sub-expressions being e t1 and e t2, in the context of memory state m, so at certain memory state e of t1 and a certain memory state e of t2. Okay, so we're basically pretending like we have to we have to address everything like memory. So denotational techniques are quite popular and form the basis for rigorous definitions of programming languages. And so when it says the rigorous definitions of programming language, I'm going to assume that most people don't do this. So research has shown that it is possible to convert denotational representations automatically to equivalent representations that are directly executable. That's interesting. So we can take, we can take these expressions and translate them directly into some machine instructions. Okay. So this is just going to be a summary of what we went over. So what did we go over? We went over syntactics, or syntax and semantics, and we went over different versions of syntax and semantics, and we saw how that they can be different or they can be the same. We saw some of the benefits, some are easier than others, but then we saw some of the drawbacks, whereas they may not represent the underlying machine instructions or be directly compilable. Okay. Okay, let's see. So let's see about this halting problem. For an example, in Java, all functions must return must return via a return expression statement where expression is assignable to the function's return type. So the following is illegal. Okay. If B is equal to zero, the subroutine fails to return a value. Okay, so this just says we'll never hit a return, so it must be illegal if b is something other than zero. So what about the following? So if we have something like this, so if b is not equal to zero, return this, else if 10 times b is equal to zero, return one. In this case, a proper return is always executed. So this means that if something is zero, we'll return, and if something is not zero, will return. So this implies that 10 times b is also equal to 0. So is the compiler expected to duplicate this rather involved chain of reasoning? Java compilers typically assume that a predicate would could evaluate to true or false, even if a detailed program analysis refutes this, that assumption. Thus, a compiler rate may reject subroutine as semantically illegal and in so doing, trade simplicity for accuracy in its analysis. So something may run correctly. However, this says that, you know, we want to make sure that it will no matter what. So you have to make your code look less like spaghetti. So indeed, the general problem of deciding whether a particular statement in a program is reachable is undecidable. Proved by reduction for the famous 
halting problem. I'm not sure what this is. We cannot ask our Java compiler to literally do the impossible. Okay. In practice, a trusted reference compiler can serve as the de facto language definition. Okay, so we can have some, some reference that we can use for a language definition. A standard interpreter is defined for a language, and the meaning of a program is precisely whatever the interpreter says. So we basically can just look at the interpreter to look at a precise definition for the language. So an elegant example is of Lisp. I've never used Lisp. I've always wanted to learn Lisp, though. Okay, so we can skip the rest of this and we can start looking at what it actually takes to organize a compiler. So compilers generally perform the following tasks. So we have a source program, we then scan it. After we scan it, the output we get are tokens. So this the scanner is, I think, also sometimes referred to as a tokenizer. Lisp, feels good, man. Do you do Lisp? Do you program in Lisp? That's awesome if you do. Listen, you, you have to point me to some resources because I'd love to learn. Okay. So then these tokens, so after the scanner and tokenizer, it goes to a parser where I'm not, I forgot what AST stands for. Oh, it's a, it's a symbol table. table. It's a symbol table. So this goes to a, this goes to a type checker. And so that's what this is right here. So all of this seems to be pointing to symbol, a symbol table, but the actual flow is this way. So after it gets transformed to some symbol table, it goes to a type checker. The type checker goes to a translator, which is then optimized. Or we can bypass optimizations. So if you guys have ever programmed in C, you'll notice that one of the compiler flags we can set is either 01, 02, or 03. And that basically refers to the amount of optimizations that we can do. Also, guys, I want to thank you guys for giving me the watches over these last couple days. I just got the I just got the award for or not the award, the little achievement thing for streaming uh, seven times in the past 30 days, so I can I can officially become a Twitch affiliate. That's right, I'm internet famous now. I'm a Twitch affiliate, or I can apply to be one. Nice. Yeah, Angel Thump, listen. We're having a great time here. I did quite a bit of it for my search and planning AI and advanced programming metaprogramming course. Yeah, wow, we affiliate. Yeah, I'll need to figure out how to apply for affiliate. Um, after I get off. I think it says that it automatically, it just gives you a button to apply for it now that I've passed that last requirement. Bigger than Mr. Mooton. Listen, the next goal, I have to get 100 average, uh, what is it? I have to get 100 average viewers. Then I can become a, a, a partner. That's the next goal. The next goal is partner. All the other requirements I will meet easily streaming seven days a week. So what we need, we need the NPR music. What we need, we need guest speakers. We need people jumping on stream. We need arguments over architecture. We need architecture drama on this stream. Okay, and then finally after the optimizer, we have the code generator. And then we have our target code down here. So this is our end result target code and we begin with the source program. But we see there's really one, two, three, four, five, six different sections that we can that we have to go through. Now some of these are optional, so the optimizer is optional. However, this gives us a really interesting, um, we can look at this in a very high level manner and we can see we can design a scanner in isolation, we can design a parser in isolation, and a lot of these other sections, we can do them piece by piece they don't necessarily have to be done in some interleaved format. We can just do a scanner. We can take that scanner and then just work on a parser, then just a type checker, etc., etc. So, okay, so abstract syntax tree. Not symbol table, abstract syntax tree. My bad. 
So analysis of the source program being compiled and synthesis of a target program that when executed will correctly perform the computations described by the source program. Okay. Almost all modern compilers are syntax directed. That is the compilation process is driven by the syntactic structure. Okay. So it turns the source program into an abstract syntax tree and we get rid of unnecessary syntactic detail. So this means that if we do a bunch of spaces in C or a bunch of things that are only there for formatting, this says that in the abstract syntax tree we're, and when we make tokens, that means we're going to cut out all of these extra spaces. We're just going to have the important bits. So semantic analysis, we just we look at meaning. And so this also begins synthesis. Then in synthesis phase, we move it into an intermediate representation. So this is some mode between our source and our final destination. We have an intermediate representation. So this is more flexible to work with. However, it's in a more generalized form that the compiler can take and turn into machine code. And so like we said earlier, this may or may not be given to an optimizer to make to improve performance. So what is a scanner? So the scanner begins the analysis of the source program. And so what happened, so this is the very beginning. And so what happens is we group characters into tokens such as identifiers, integers, reserved words. So in this stage, everything gets broken down into, like we said, a token. So if we had something such as int a equals eight, or we have, so we know that int will be a reserved word for a type, we see that we have a here, so this will be a variable, so this will be, a, the token here will be a variable, so it will go keyword, variable, assignment operator, and then it will be some input of this type. So that's what these tokens mean. It will be more generic though, so this will just be it will just make sure that this is a keyword, this is a non-keyword, but it has to follow some definition. It will make sure that this is an assignment, and it will make sure that this is of the correct type. Okay. So it puts the program into a compact form. So in the output tokens, we're not going to have this space or this space or this space. We're just going to have int a equals eight, no spaces. So like we said, a compact, a compact and uniform format. We get rid of unnecessary information like comments because those don't affect the program. So it's compact and uniform. It processes compiler directives. So turning on listing on or off or including source text from a specified file. So at the top of a C program, if you do an include at the top of a C program, it will grab whatever file you're telling it to include and it will paste it at the top of that program. It sometimes enters preliminary information into a symbol table. For example, to register the presence of a particular label or identifier. And so optionally, It'll format and lists the source program. Okay. So a lot of times when we're so when we're doing something such as a scanner, 
the tool that we're going to be used to create this is regular expressions. And so recognition of regular sets is this basis of the scanner generator. So we can actually, we can actually use tools that will automatically generate uh, scanners. So there's a lot of commonly uh, used tools for this. So Lex and Yak are two very common ones. Uh, there's another one that I can't remember. I think Lex and Yak are C++, but the, oh, uh, Bison. Bison is for Java. Lex and Yak is for C. OK, so let's talk about the parser for a little bit. So the parser is based on formal syntax specifications. So this is the grammar stuff. So parsers are typically driven by tables created by CFGs by a parser generator. The parser verifies correct syntax. Listen, let's look at what CFGs are. I already forgot what CFGs were. Does anyone remember? Hmm. Context-free grammar. That's right. You're right. I forgot. I knew the G was grammar. OK. So if syntax error is found, it issues a suitable error message. So we'll still, we're still receiving compile errors at this point. Also, sometimes they're smart enough to actually fix the errors. So syntactic error recovery repair can be done automatically by consulting structures created by suitable parser generator. So that's pretty neat. We can have something that actually does its own recovery. OK, so let's look at the type checker, semantic analysis. So the type checker does this static semantics of uh, abstract syntax tree nodes. That is, it verifies that the construct of the node represents something legal, but also meaningful. So what do we mean by decorates down here? So if the construct is sem semantically correct, we decorate that node by adding type information to it. So if it's semantically correct, we get to add types. And then we also have error messages if there's problems. So what does the translator do? Otherwise known as program synthesis. So if the abstract syntax tree node is semantically correct and we've decorated it, it can be translated into IR code. So remember, IR is intermediate representation that correctly implements the meaning of the abstract syntax tree node. For example, an AST for a while loop contains two subtrees one representing the loop's expression and another representing the loop's body. So basically the conditional check and then whatever the body executes. However, nothing in the abstract syntax tree explicitly captures the notion of while loops. The, this meaning is captured when a while loops AST is translated to intermediate representation. So what happens in IR and then IR the notion of testing the value of the loop control expression and conditionally executing the loop body is made explicit. OK, so now we're doing a little bit more explicit work. OK. So in the GNU compiler collection, so a lot of times GCC, people just call GCC a compiler. It's not a compiler. It's actually a compiler collection. GCC does does not stand for GNU C compiler. It stands for GNU or GNU compiler collection. So elaborate compilers like GCC may first generate high level IR and then trans translate that into low level IR. So GCC has been around a long time and it's had a lot of optimizations. So then we have a symbol table. So what is a symbol table? It's a mechanism that allows information to be associated with identifiers. And then this is shared among compiler phases. So generally use symbol tables extensively during type checking. However, they have use in other parts of the compiler phases for checking things like types and variables and procedures and labels. So for example, a program representation 
such as an abstract syntax tree, may be expanded and refined to provide detailed information needed by optimizers, code generators, linkers, loaders, and debuggers. Interesting. Okay, so let's let's do a couple words on the optimizer, all right? And let's talk about the optimizer for a little bit. So the IR code generated by the translator is analyzed and transformed into functionally equivalent but improved IR code. So we still have IR code here. We're not at the machine instructions yet. However, now we're turning the IR code into something that's, you know, a little bit nicer, something that's a little bit more efficient, but we're getting there. We're getting a lot closer. So optimization can be done after code generation. So after we've already generated some machine code, we can still optimize it. And so an example is called peephole optimization. So we look at our generated code a few instructions at a time, hence the name peephole. So this will be things like we're going to eliminate multiplications by one or additions by zero. So basically getting rid of instructions that effectively don't do anything. So it may not help. Uh, it, it's not as good as, a, of course, a full scale optimizer. However, it still does improve code and it's useful in some minor cleanup. So then finally we have the code generator. So what does a code generator do? Well, it generates code. So it takes the intermediate representation code that may or may not be optimized. In this stage, we need information about the machine, the target machine. So we need information about the ISA, the instruction set architecture. So the notion of automatic construction of code generators has been actively studied the basic approach is to match low-level IR to target instructions. So this basically says if we have some patterns in our intermediate representation, we can just substitute in immediately those instructions. So this approach localizes the target machine specifics of a compiler and, at least in principle, makes it easy to retarget a compiler to a new target machine. Automatic retargeting is an especially desirable goal since a great deal of work is usually needed to move a compiler to a new machine. Interesting. So once again, GNU Compiler Collection, GCC, is a heavily optimizing compiler that can target over 30 computer architectures from Intel to Spark to good old PowerPC. Isn't that awesome? And you can have six different front ends, C, C++, Fortran, Ada, and Java. I bet a lot of you people didn't know that GCC could compile Java. Well, now we do. Look at that. We learn something new every day. OK. So we can look a little bit about compiler writing tools. So finally, let's talk about these, com these tools. So there's advanced packages that can aid in error repair generation, but oftentimes we're really just concerned about compiler generators or compiler compilers. Isn't this a neat term? Compiler compilers. This is, this is some Terminator level stuff. Machines building machines. <laughs> compiler compilers. So these sorts of generators greatly assist the crafting of compilers, but much of the effort in crafting compiler lies in writing and debugging the semantic phases. So a lot of the times, you know, this translation effort to the machine code, I would guess is probably the least, not as intensive of a part. The more intensive part, I would guess, is likely something such as, you know, making sure that whatever you make can correctly translate. Okay. So a brief thought on programming language and compile design. I think we'll probably just stick at chapter one today. So our primary interest is the design and implementation of compilers for modern programming languages. So 
many clever and sometimes subtle compiler techniques arise from the need to cope with some programming language constructs. So a good example is the closure mechanism that was invented to handle formal procedures. So a closure is a special runtime representation for a function. It is usually implemented as a pointer to a function's body. So we have a pointer to a function's body and to its execution environment. While the concept of closure is attractive from a programming language design perspective, apparently this can be hard for compilers. It's a difficult problem. So the state of the art in compiler design also strongly affects programming language design. So we can design a programming language as much as, as we can you know, really try to make a good programming language, but if the compiler isn't there, then did we really make a good programming language? So it is often easier to learn, read, and understand if a feature is hard to compile. Oh, sorry. It is often easier to learn, read, and understand. If a feature is hard to compile, it may well be difficult to understand. So this kind of gives us this feedback of if we did something that's difficult to understand, then it's likely that it will be hard to compile. So we can get this kind of sanity check. If we have a quality compiler on very on a wide variety of machines, this is crucial to a language's success. If we want a, our language to really take off, it should probably be able to use everywhere. Okay. Often, better code will be generated. So this brings up this great idea. It's one of the famous. It's one of the famous kind of expressions. You know, garbage in, garbage out. If you write bad code, oftentimes you'll get bad results. Compilers like it when you do things well. <laughs> so fewer compiler bugs will occur. If a language cannot be easily understood, then it will often make it difficult to write a compiler for it. The compiler will be smaller, cheaper, faster, more reliable, and more widely used. Compiler diagnostic messages and program development tools will often be better. So if it's easy to compile something, people more people will use it. Oftentimes this will lead to better compilers, faster, smaller compilers, uh, lots of good things. Okay, so now we can get into more my interest in compilers, which is on the computer architecture side. So advances in computer architecture and fabrication have spearheaded the computer revolution. So the only reason why computers are so big are because of computer architects. At one time, a computer offering one megaflop, which is one million flops, floating point operations per second, was considered advanced. But now we're at teraflops to petaflops, and I think we're even to yotta flops maybe have become a matter of packaging and cooling. So that's packaging and cooling has become a problem now. So individual computer itself is often itself a microprocessor and each processor of the computer may have multiple cores. So we're in the multi-core era. Very interesting thing. Compiler designers are responsible for making this vast computing capability available to programmers. Although compilers are rarely visible to the end user's application program. So often an end user will just see a program, will run a program. They don't care how it was compiled. The, prob the problems encountered in efficiently harnessing the capability of modern computing platforms are numerous. And so here's some of them. So x86, or x86 is a pain. That's all I'm going to leave here. This entire paragraph is just saying x86 is bad. <laughs> Listen, that's my hot take. You can argue it if you want. Try to do something with this x86. It's not a good language. It's, it has so many legacy instructions. And it's, there are people that have wrote, written entire research papers on basically criticizing x86's design. However, I mean, everyone's processor is also an Intel chip for the most part. So 
that begs the question, does it even matter? <laughs> so high level programming languages operations are not always easy to support. So if we have high level languages like Python or even Java, um, they can be difficult to support. Essential architectural features such as hardware caches and distributed processors and memory are difficult to present to programmers. This is very interesting to me actually. So the reason why not many people know CUDA or programming CUDA, CUDA is the programming language to um, code for NVIDIA GPUs. The reason why they didn't do this is because it's so difficult to manage memory and threads just because of the sheer number of threads and GPUs because of that it basically forces the user to do all that management because the compilers can't do that for you. So effective use of large number of processors has always posed challenges that's similar to the GPU issue. So let's look at some design considerations for compilers. So debugging, a debugging compiler is designed to help debug programs. It carefully scrutinizes programs and details programmer errors. So we can use things such as a debugging compiler that basically checks to see if we wrote spaghetti code. These compilers may include the checking of code that can detect runtime errors. They can do symbolic and initiate a sim symbolic debugger. When a program neared completion, compilation switched to a production compiler, which increased compilation execution speed by ignoring diagnostic concerns. So this is a past thing in the past. This strategy has been likened by Tony Huar, like wearing a life jacket in sailing classes held on dry land. So this basically says that this is some overprotection stuff. Indeed, it is becoming increasingly clear for that for almost all applications, reliability far more important than speed. We'd rather have a program that runs than one that crashes and we lose data. So for Java, mandates runtime, runtime checks. C and C++ do not. So I, I suppose that is, we've got a point for C, or we've got a point for Java, rather. OK. A note on optimizing compilers. So optimizing compiler is specifically designed to produce efficient target code. So it's actually a misnomer apparently. This is because no compiler of any sophistication can produce optimal code. It can just do its best. The reason is twofold. So this is so the two reasons why we can't claim that it's optimal is because it's impossible to tell whether two programs are equivalent. So this is undecidable. Such a question cannot generally be answered by any computer program. Thus finding the simplest is impossible because if you, you cannot compare it really to something else. So you can go by execution time, but you can't compare program to program to determine which is optimal. Second, many program optimizations require time uh, proportional to an exponential function of size of the program being compiled. Thus, optimal code, even when theoretically possible, is often infeasible in practice. OK, so this basically says that if we really do want to do something that quote unquote is optimal code, it would take an extraordinarily long time to compile, just with the number of optimization runs that we'd perform on it. And so then it says what, what we'll probably look at in chapter 13 and chapter 14. So considering data flow frameworks and static single assignment form. So we don't need to really know about this now. It's something that we will cover later. OK, retargetable compilers. This is interesting. So compilers are designed for a particular language and a particular target computer. So say. We want to, so we have a compiler that is for C that targets the x86 
uh, instruction set or some x86 chip. So because a wide variety of programming languages and computers exist, it would be nice if we could kind of plug and play and say, okay, well now I want to take in C++, but I want to target some ARM instruction set. And so that's what we mean by a retargetable compiler. We can say retarget this compiler to now generate for an ARM instruction set. Okay, so then we don't have to do a lot of duplication. So then we can ha we have a little note on IDEs. So most IDEs provide immediate feedback concerning syntax and semantics. So that's one thing over text editors. Now I will personally always use Vim. I love Vim. I love that it's so lightweight. Vim will never crash on me. And with integrated tools like C tags or extensions like C tags, I, I pretty much fail to see the need for an IDE, at least for me. The IDE focus is typically on the source program with any derived files such as object code carefully managed beyond the user's window or a user's view. And then most IDE provides key or mouse actions that provide information about the program as it is developed. So a lot of times in IDE you can press the definition of a function in a file and it will take you to a file uh, where, or take you to where say that function is used or if you click on the function in another part of the file it will take you back to the definition. So this is okay but you can also do this in Vim. With C tags you can press control and then the right bracket and it will take you to the definition as long as there's a tag generated. So. The argument for IDEs over text editors is often misconstrued. Often they are comparing IDEs to, it would be like comparing an IDE to Notepad. That's what a lot of people seem to do. So we focus on the traditional batch compilation approach where the entire source file is translated. However, many of the techniques we develop can be reformulated into, inter, into uh, incremental form to support IDEs. For example, a parser can reparse only those portions of the program that have changed. So this is similar to a make file. If we say make a make file and we have some giant project, maybe we make a change to one file. And let's say that when we run make, it takes a half hour to make. Well, we wouldn't want to have to take a half hour every time we make a small change or add a comment. So oftentimes make files will check to see what has already been generated and then will only compile again what has changed. And so in summary, we're going to concentrate on C, C++, and Java. JVM is going to be used in a later chapter. So we're going to look at code generation for RISC processors, such as MIPS. Now in our computer architecture course, we're going over RISC-5, RISC but the ideas are very similar. Also, we're going to be looking at Spark in Chapter 13. And so this is mainly going to be at the code generation stages. So like so, many, uh, like so much else in crafting a compiler, experience is the best guide. We begin with the translation of very simple languages in Chapter 2. So we will define our own language that we will work with that has very few keywords and then very few functions in it just for the just for the case of simplicity and then we will work our way up to more challenging translation tasks so translation tasks that are more like uh, something that would be done in C or C++ or Java okay and there's some exercises down here but we won't spend time doing that today I think we've done a great job today I think we're going to leave it here today. Now, I think we'll cut the stream about an hour early. I know that many of you probably want to get back to watching Destiny. I know he just got home. I know you're dying to see him. So I'll stay around for about 12 more minutes and we can just have some banter. We can just give, we can just do a little bit of talking. How is everyone doing today? We having a good time today? Listen, I just got the notification that I've completed everything for 
the affiliate status. Let's see if we can let's see if we can get that set up. I don't know what we need to do. Hmm, interesting. Let's go to our dashboard. Oh, let's go to notifications. Path to affiliate complete. Hmm. You're eligible to become a Twitch affiliate. Click get started to begin. Okay. I click get started. It it took me to another 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 stream or another screen. Huh. Interesting. Huh. Is that it? Am I affiliate onboarding? I have an onboarding. Oh, okay. Two factor authentication. I have to set up two factor authentication. Oh, and the site's broken. <laughs> Listen, I would have shown you guys on stream. I would have shown you guys what had just happened on stream, but basically I went to I went to the section where it said to okay, go here to you know, set up two factor or two FA in order to become a Twitch affiliate and I went there, clicked the one button and the site was broken. Interesting. Okay, listen, any feedback? How did, what did everyone think about compilers today? Everyone think compilers were interesting? Do they think they were not interesting? What do they wanna see next time? So tomorrow I think is going to be computer networks. I think that should be fairly interesting. I've uh, never worked on computer networks either. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Hmm. Okay. Well. Hmm. What else can we do? We got about 10 more minutes. I'll stay on for about 10 more minutes. I'll stay on until the top of the hour. It's okay. We did we did quite a lot today. We went over an entire research paper. That's good. Let's look at that PC that I built the other day. Or that I priced out the other day. View my system build. So what did we get on this anyway? So we got an i7-8700K, we got this cryo rig cooler, we got this gigabyte motherboard, sure. We got this meme rip jaws, 16 gigs, DDR4. We got an Evo because hey, why not? Evos are pretty good. We got a 1060 because we don't need something too special, we just need something that works. We got a fractal case because it was the only case that looked good. We got a power supply. We got two lovely 1080p monitors. I like these. I thought these looked pretty nice. I I like the uh, I like the simple design. I hate the monitors that have like red LEDs on them. I'd rather have. Uh, I'd ra I'd rather have. I want simplicity. We looked at the Zowie wired optical mouse. Listen, it's 60 bucks. I'll probably end up changing this. I don't want to spend $60 on a mouse. I don't I I probably want to spend $10 on a mouse. I mean, I'm using some Actually, I have no idea why I have an HP mouse or where this came from. I have a my lab machine is a Dell, my monitor is a Dell. My other monitor is an HP. Huh. That's weird. Oh, let's look up the uh, NPR microphone. By the way, geomonkeys.com slash book. This is what I use for most of the lip stuff. Lisp, ugh, lisp. Okay, let's see. Let's, let's look at this for a second. Why lisp? Okay. Hmm. So it's hard to describe why Lisp is useful or 
what the advantages of Lisp. Let's actually go over this. I'm actually curious. So it's hard to explain why it's useful in a few pages or why some people like it. We're already off to a great start. They did not do a good job at prefacing this. I think this is a bad first sentence that they're trying to sell me, but that's okay. I'm persistent. Perhaps I like Lisp because of some quirk in the way my brain is wired. Wait, they're making it sound like Lisp is just a bad language that people like because they have problems. Okay. What does it do better? That's all I care about. Hmm. For some languages, the payoff is relatively obvious. For instance, if you want to write low-level code on Unix, of course you should learn C. Java, C++, sure. So this is a language where the payoff is not so easily categorized because it's about subjective criteria and how it feels. So Perl advocates like to say Perl makes things easy and hard things possible and revel in the fact that that as the Perl model has it, there's more than one way to do it. And so they compare Perl to Python. Okay, I don't care. So common Lisp. Mm -hmm. The nearest thing common Lisp has to a motto it's like the Cohen-like description, the programmable programming languages. Okay, here we go. Consequently, a common list program tends to provide a much clearer mapping between your ideas about how the program works and the code you actually write. Okay, so that's interesting to me. I think on, on the idea of programmability, this makes sense to me. This also means you'll develop code more quickly there's less code to write, and you don't waste time thrashing about ways to find or finding clean ways to express your ideas. I mean, I already like it. This is already pretty interesting to me. I think I'm probably, maybe, maybe that's what we'll do sometime this Sunday. Maybe sometime this Sunday we'll look a little bit into doing this, into look, looking into Lisp. It's a really different beast. Yeah, I mean, um, doesn't isn't there an XKCD comic on Lisp? There's probably uh, a couple. Uh, here we go. I thought this was pretty funny. Lisp is over half a century old and it still has this perfect timeless air about it. I wonder if the cycles will continue forever. A few coders from each new generation rediscovering the Lisp arts. <laughs> These are your father's parentheses, elegant weapon, weapons for a more civilized age. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I thought this was pretty good. I looked up, I remember looking up Lisp and I, gra I, I gazed through a book on Lisp after this. Listen, XKCD, XKCD gets it right a lot of the times. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. I think this might be my favorite one. This is your machine learning system? Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. <laughs> For me, it was somewhat natural because the first it was the first language I learned. What, uh, the first language I learned was Scheme. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Lisp and Prolog are the same type of language, right? They're classed together, aren't they? I've never done either, but. I always hear about, uh, kinda, okay. I guess it's because aren't Lisp and Prolog both associated with artificial intelligence? But Prolog is all about logic. I remember looking up these at one time, like Prolog and Lisp. I remember University of Texas. I think University of Texas, their intro 
CS course was either in Prologue or Lisp. It was one of the two, I think. Prologue is really weird if you're just a programmer trying to do stuff. Yeah, that's what I remember looking into it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Oh, wait. I know what I was going to look up. Oh, I'm going to save this. It's a completely different paradigm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's built for artificial intelligence, isn't it? Isn't that like what NASA uses? Doesn't NASA use Lisp? What was I going to look up? I was going to look up something else. Oh, yeah. The NPR microphone. I'm in Prologue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Prologue. Yeah, Lisp uh, was really big for AI for a long time. Yeah. What's big for AI now? Literally just... It's different now, though. People write AI stuff in CUDA. Actually, do you know what AI stuff is actually written in? Well, so it's written, so it's run on GPUs, so it has to be written in what can be run on GPUs, right? So that means it has to be written in CUDA. But do you want do you, do you want me to let you in on a little secret? So Nvidia, Nvidia doesn't write their AI libraries in their machine learning libraries. They actually do not write them in CUDA. They write them in assembly directly and they tune them directly in assembly because that's how you can squeeze out performance. Yeah, yikes. But hey, if you ever want to wonder why NVIDIA is such a big company and why NVIDIA will continue to grow and AMD will never match NVIDIA at least for in the foreseeable future as in like in the scale of years they will not match NVIDIA it's simply because of developers 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 It's simply because of developers, 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 developers. This is why AMD will never match NVIDIA for the foreseeable future. It's because AMD has almost no developers. They have some, they have hardware people. They have almost no software people. That's why they're so far behind. So NVIDIA can, has entire teams dedicated to write, to writing Kublos and QDNN directly in assembly and tuning them directly in assembly. While AMD goes, hey community, do you want to write some libraries? That's what, it, that's what AMD does. And it, it works for them to some extent because they have lower overhead because they're not hiring developers. But on the same token, that lower overhead only makes you competitive if the company that's spending the money on that overhead isn't producing a quality product. And NVIDIA right now is just churning out the best of the best with machine learning. So... AMD is has not been smart in what they've been doing. Listen. If you ever meet somebody that works at AMD, just send them this picture and tell them you want to you want to you want that stock to go to the moon. Just send them this picture of developers 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 developers. What's really interesting to me is why Intel hasn't been able to make a GPU. Or why their parallel accelerator, that Knight's Landing meme, why that was such a piece of crap. They're working on it. No, they, yeah, they have been. So that's what Knight's Landing also is. 
Knight's Landing has all is, is pretty much the same idea of a PCIe parallel accelerator, but it's just bad. So my hot take on this is that Intel will never be in that market. Intel will never be competitive in that market because it's already cornered by NVIDIA and AMD. And even though AMD is behind NVIDIA, both of them are so much farther ahead than Intel. That's my hot take on it. Hmm. Okay. Steve Ballmer, man. What a legend. All I know is that they hired the Vega dude from AMD. Sure. Um, Intel. Vega. Hire. Yeah, this guy. Continue to article. Chris Hook. We still harbor doubts about Intel is throwing itself headfirst into this. Yeah. So, I mean, they can they can hire more people now, but they're so far behind that I don't think it matters. I mean, they're, they're behind. They're a bloated company. They have the resources, though, but I don't know how much that matters. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if your company is poised to make a radical switch. And right now, they're so stuck in churning out CPUs. And so, the, so here's the problem. The problem is that they've worked for the longest time in improving CPUs. And so everything that they know is improving CPUs. Now, there's some crossover with GPUs, but they're fundamentally different. But another big factor is that, so we all know that Moore's Law is slowing down because we can't make transistors much smaller. So they've already had problems getting to 10 nanometers. So how are they going to get to seven nanometers? How are they going to get to seven nanometer technology? So if with all the resources, they are, they are struggling to get to 10. And believe me, everyone's struggling to get to 10. Volta, G, uh, NVIDIA's Volta architecture, uh, like for the Titan V and the V100, that was supposed to be a 10, meter, 10 nanometer technology chip. However, they only were able to get to 12 or 14 nanometers. So they predicted they would be at 10, but they were not able to make it. So, you know, if they're already struggling to get to 10, how, how much more scaling can they do? And if you can't do much more scaling, that means you have to improve the processor in a more difficult fashion. Transistor scaling is the, well, at least for the longest time, it was the easiest way to get performance because you basically just have the size of transistors and you got a twice as fast chip. So I don't know. It's a very interesting problem right now. Not to mention power is a big problem. With transistor density the way it is, how do you dissipate the heat when transistors are so dense? Okay. So before we cut the stream, let's look at what we're going to be studying tomorrow. Let me open it up. Open. Save. Where is it? Is it this one? Nope. Is it? That's operating. Oh, here it is. It's the first book. OK. So if you look at the schedule below, we're going to, we're going to be doing computer networks tomorrow. So within computer networks, we're going to be doing chapter one. 
Let's see what chapter one is over. So, so chapter one is going to be core ideas that we're going to use the text. We're going to motivate these ideas based upon real world applications and discuss what goes into network architecture. We're going to do we're going to introduce things like protocols and implementation issues to show what kind of things we will uh, look at in the future and define the quanti uh, the quantitative performance metrics that drive network design. So how are we going to measure the performance of our network and determine whether or not what we did is good or bad? Lev, I made brown I made brown rice Spanish rice. Hey, that's pretty awesome, Lev. Great job. I'm very proud of you. Okay. Hmm. So for the people still in chat, quick question. Should I stay on, banter around a little bit more? We finished the chapter we were going through a day, uh, today. But we can stay on a little bit more if you guys just want to banter around a little bit. Otherwise, we can move on. We can move on to our respective evenings, spend wonderful time with our loved ones, go back to the DGG chat and watch Destiny's Return to PoE or League of Kenny Loggins. Hmm. You know, I've never taken a class on computer networks. You should take a break, uh, take a break, and play with your GPUs. Hmm. See, I would want to. I, I'd like to do that on stream. Um, let me go ahead and try to do that. Yeah, I know League, right? I'm not a big fan of League. Listen, I already told my story. You guys already heard my story playing League. Here. Let me. I can prove that I have a, a Volta card in my lab, but I need to open up a terminal, SSH in, and then I need to. Uh, what's it called? I need to. I need to alias my username so that it doesn't show up after I SSH in. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. I want to go on PCO4. What? What? Uh. Uh. Warning, remote host identification has changed. It is possible that someone is doing something nasty. Someone could be eavesdropping. Okay. Let's do this. Copy. Offending key IP. Are you sure you want to continue connecting? Yes. You could use your lab to DDoS Destiny because he's playing lead League. Use my amazing connection. Hmm. Uh, how do I... I just discovered YouTube has blocked all Blender Foundation videos apparently because they have an ethical objection to monetizing. I have no idea what Blender Foundation videos are. I have never heard of that actually. Hmm. Blender Foundation. Is that just the program Blender? The 3D rendering thing? Okay. I know nothing about Blender. I knew about it when people, when I was like in middle school or high school and people were getting into graphic design, but I'm not a graphic designer, so I guess I don't know anything. Um, oh, how do I get rid of the, yeah, it's open, yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's a, it's a rendering thing. It's what 
people make some cool video stuff on. Okay. Let's see if I can get rid of the... Does that mean I have to alias away my... I'm doing this I'm doing this all off stream because I'm not I'm trying not to dox myself. So I have to alias away the environment variable that has my name in it. <sighs> this is fun. Nope. Uh, bam, bot, bash, rc. Um, what is it? Is p1 the environment variable for the username, right? What is it? If I do echo p oh or yeah my p one so p p zero p one p two p four huh that's interesting change change user name terminal bash. Update OS X. Fun too. How do I change my username? Pseudo user mod. Uh huh. No, I'm not doing that. Let's see. Change bash prompt name. Change the prompt in Linux. Okay, here we go. You can see by. Okay, this is changed by changing the environment variable PS1. Why don't I see PS1 though? Is because I have. Hmm. Echo. Oh wait, now it works. Interesting. So that means I have to go vim dot bash. Why, did, why wasn't it showing up before? Oh, it's PS1. Whoops. So insert. So let's do PS1. This do PS1 is equal to engineering today space dollar sign space all right so let's write all let's control z let's foreground oh no no control z let's bash again unexpected whatever huh 98 119 okay so let's exit that so let's foreground it. Huh? Oh, whoops, I never closed the parentheses. I'm, I'm dumb. Right all. Bash again. Okay. Oh, my name's still at the top of the terminal. Never mind. Okay, this isn't going to work. Whoops. Whoops. Okay, that's not gonna work. What is your setup like in your lab? Thanks for the good, okay, gotta go. Thanks for the good stream vibrations. Hey man, nice to see you here. Stir it up, YouTube is dying. I don't know YouTube is dying. Okay. What is your stream, or what is your setup like in your lab? Okay, what do you wanna know, Lev? What about my stream setup? I have a picture of some of it. Let me let me look up the imager account. Hmm. I think I have some pictures of my lab in here. Oh, pictures of my computer. So this is my desk with a bunch of uh, 
Lebanese food on it. This is the favorite picture I have on my desk because I wish it was like this right now. That would be amazing. I love kebab. Kebab is so good. Um, do I have any other pictures on my desk? Or let me check to see if it's on my other account, but I need to make sure my name's not on my other account. I had my name on my other account for the longest time like an idiot. I have not submitted any. Huh, okay. Interesting. Listen, Hitman, you're, you're you're having a good time. I'm happy you're having a good time. Kebab kaboop. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I have I have a dual monitor set up, which is it's not terribly special. It's just two monitors. I've got a I've got one of those big wooden desks. Or not big wooden desks. I have one of those generic desks that it has like the metal cabinets or like the two metal cabinets on the bottom with the metal legs and then it's a two-tiered desk where you have like the big flat desk space that my my PC and my two monitors and mouse keyboard are on and then it has a second tier above that where I have crafting a compiler I have an algorithms book I have an OS book a logic design book a 21st century C book, a computer networks book, a graph theory book, a computer organization and design book, a, program, a programming massively parallel processors book, a computer architecture book, an advanced programming in the Unix environment book, and a C algorithms book. A lot of books. And then I have a little vacuum, and, huh, and I have a hole punch and a couple binders. Yeah. Nothing special. Um, I thought for sure that I had, let me see if I can find my other account. I have it somewhere. Let me log out of this one, sign out. Let me log in with Google. I don't know which one even signed out. Enjoy amazing content, sign in, sign in with Google. Interesting. So let's sign in with this account. Allow. Oh, that's the account I was already on. Okay, that's fine. Have you considered sanding this? Love having one at my work? I'm not paying for this desk. This is just from the university. Like, I'm in a university lab, so I doubt I have the sway to ask for a standing desk. <laughs> Lev, do you know how I get a standing desk? Here's how I get a standing desk. Uh, to get a standing desk, I write a bunch of best paper. I, I write a bunch of papers that get best paper, and I bring in a bunch of money to the school. And then I probably have some sway to get a standing desk. Hmm. Let me see if I can remove my name from a terminal. Remove name from terminal Ubuntu. How to remove computer name from command line prompt. Okay, I mean, I know how to do this. So let's just change PS1. From top of terminal. Let's see if that's a question. How do I move hostname part in terminal prompt? Nope. Hmm. Yeah, this is weird. I might just have to change the actual username. That's dumb. Hmm. Lev, how's research going? What are you doing? What kind of research? Or well, I know you're doing stuff with CNNs, right? How's that going? Mm. 
Mm. Reading. Yeah, reading's pretty good. Let's see. There's a chapter in this book about that. Um, but it's mainly how to do it on GPUs. Here we go. It's chapter 16 of application case study of, I'm sorry. It's chapter 16 of programming massively parallel processors, the third edition. It has an entire section on application case study machine learning. And it goes over the background, convolutional neural networks, uh, convolutional networks, basic layers, and then convolutional networks back propagation. Then it goes over the basic CUDA implementation of a forward propagation. It goes over reduction of convolutional layer by matrix multiplication. Then it goes over the CUDNN library, and then it has exercises. So that's about as much as I know about CNNs, is what I got from this book, which is a good amount. I think it's a good amount. Uh, OK. Well, right now I'm trying to allow, I'm trying to allow for leave one out cross validation. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. It's an old technique. That's from like 20 years ago. Right? It's from like 98, 99 ish. All of it's old? Yeah, some of it. I think we're done for today. I think tomorrow we're going to have a great time getting into chapter one of this computer networks book. Hmm. We have infinite power now. <laughs> okay. Let's get to this. Okay, here's the chapter. Okay, this is what we're going to get into tomorrow. All right. So listen, guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed the stream, give me a follow. If you didn't enjoy watching the stream, you don't have to give me a follow. Listen, we already did the goal of the stream. We became a Twitch affiliate today. So thank you, guys. I will see you guys tomorrow at the exact same time. If you're especially lucky, you'll catch it. I might do an early morning EU stream just to get, just to, just to soak up all those EU viewers that are just dying for content after Destiny goes to sleep. So listen, everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining me today. Give me a follow on YouTube or on Twitch or on Twitter at Engineering Today. I have a Facebook at Go Engineering Today. But that's not important. The only thing that's important is that I hope that you get out there and that you learn something new. Thanks for joining me. Ciao.